Oppenheimer was a leading voice in wanting arms control. He knew that uh, nuclear Armageddon could be imminent if there was going to be a huge nuclear arms race. Oppenheimer's reaction to when the first nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were mixed. There was obviously a professional pride that this project that he had masterminded had paid off. But at the same time, what he was aware of, that everything he had created was causing death on a monumental scale. What must it be like to have spent your life doing something, to have done it, to have done it more successfully you can ever imagine, and then to see the consequences of it could potentially be life-changing and not, if not life-destroying for everybody on the planet. And certainly he was somebody who, after the war and after the, the launch, I think he was mistrusted because he didn't seem to be positive about what he'd done. He seemed to be rather racked with guilt. There was a big worry that actually by triggering a nuclear explosion, you might cause the entire atmosphere to burn up. And if that happened, that would be the end of the world. Born in 1904, Julius Robert Oppenheimer grew up in a non-observant Jewish family in New York City. His mother was a painter. His father was a German immigrant who'd made his fortune by importing textiles. The family lived in Manhattan and had an enviable art collection, which included works by Picasso and Van Gogh. In 1911, young Julius Oppenheimer entered the Ethical Culture Society School, which was founded as part of a secular humanist movement that aimed at grounding children in ethics. Here, Oppenheimer found his calling. He excelled academically and took a keen interest in chemistry. In 1921, he graduated high school and was ready to study at university. But a bout of colitis after a family vacation in Czechoslovakia rendered him weak and bedridden. He recovered in New Mexico, where he developed an affinity for Southwestern America. A year later, he moved to New England to study at Harvard, where he majored in chemistry. To compensate for his late start, Oppenheimer took extra courses and was even granted graduate standing in physics, which meant he could bypass basic courses in favor of advanced ones. In only three years, he graduated summa cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts degree. After Harvard, he was accepted by Christ's College, University of Cambridge, for further education. However, he found himself very unhappy there. Oppenheimer developed an antagonistic relationship with his tutor and even allegedly tried to poison him. While he was passionate about science and academia, Oppenheimer led a very troubled life. Oppenheimer, like all brilliant scientists, actually didn't really obey the rules of society that much. In some ways, scientists are true bohemians, much more than the kind of arty types. So, you know, he was you know, sexually promiscuous, he cheated on his partners, you know, he didn't care much for morality uh, in a kind of wholesome bourgeois middle-class way. So he cut this very kind of, you know, strange figure. He was also terribly thin. He was very underweight. He often got ill. He was a chain smoker. Uh, he studied mysticism. You know, he wasn't a straightforward, you know, man in a white lab coat. He was a very quirky, very bohemian, very complicated figure. On the 22nd of August, 1939, Albert Einstein and Leo Slizard sent a letter to the 32nd President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The two scientists warned Roosevelt that the Germans were harboring uranium sources for research into nuclear fission, 
which could lead to the creation of highly destructive bombs. This letter would soon change the very course of the world. At the time of its delivery, Europe was on the verge of chaos. Nazi dictator Adolf Hitler sat at the helm of Germany, infecting his citizens with hate and division. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland, triggering a declaration of war from Britain and France under the 1918 Treaty of Versailles. Within six weeks, the German army crushed Poland, executing thousands of citizens in the process. A dark cloud soon loomed over Europe. It was not until 1941 that the conflict spread beyond Europe's borders. In the December, Japan launched a surprise attack on US naval base Pearl Harbor. The military strike killed over 2,400 people and destroyed 19 US Navy ships. The reason why it was so symbolic and so successful was that America had never been attacked like that on their home shores, especially in the modern era. And it was proof that the Japanese were this highly mechanized force, utterly ruthless, who could commit an act like this of absolute audacity and absolute violence. As his citizens mourned, FDR retaliated fast, declaring war on Japan and bringing the US into the most destructive conflict in history. In the summer of 1942, FDR approved the creation of the Manhattan Project, bringing together research scientists and military engineers from across the US and Canada. The birth of the atomic bomb finally commenced. The Manhattan Project has got lots of different roles, if you like. The primary role, of course, is to build a nuclear bomb that you can use you know, in the war. Some of the other roles are also to try and establish what level of nuclear capacity do other countries have, and of course, especially Nazi Germany. Of course, the Manhattan Project is also there to construct all the stuff around to build a nuclear bomb. So it's got to mastermind factories. It's got to mastermind getting hold of uranium. It's got a mastermind creating plutonium. So it's got lots and lots of different roles. And this is gonna take place initially, you know, masterminded from Manhattan, hence the name, but it's gonna take place in locations all over the United States, all the way through to California and even in Canada. General Leslie Groves of the Manhattan Engineer District commanded the project. A hard-headed leader with an intensity often feared by his inferiors, Groves stopped at nothing to make the mission a success. Even though Groves wasn't a genius, his single act of genius, the one thing he really gets right is to appoint Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer went on to achieve his doctorate in 1927 at the age of 23 from the University of Göttingen in Germany. By the time he returned to the US, he was a respected and experienced physicist. He taught at Caltech, Harvard, UC Berkeley, and worked alongside highly acclaimed scientists and made important contributions to the field of science. His focus on advancing science never came in the way of his adoration for literature and the mystical. His interest in Hindu literature is well known, as he called the Bhagavad Gita one of the books that most shaped his philosophy of life.
Oppenheimer remained uninformed on global affairs until the 1930s, after which he became increasingly involved in international politics. Having lived in Germany at a time when intolerance against Jews was rising, no doubt had an impact on Oppenheimer. He supported social reform and often donated to leftist causes, making him a contentious figure in the scientific world. Oppenheimer lacked a Nobel Prize. He preferred theoretical science over practical. He was politically left-leaning, often attending Communist Front activities and even going on to marry a member of the Communist Party. Oppenheimer was very much drawn to the politics of the left. He was never formally a member of the Communist Party. He was never a communist agitator. Yet he would later describe himself as being a fellow traveler, someone who was immensely sympathetic towards left-wing causes. He had inherited a lot of money when his parents had died, uh, and there was an enormous state split between him and his brother, Frank. And actually, Oppenheimer was the type of guy, you know, who actually left that to good causes and to university work, rather than, you know, give it to any uh, offspring or relatives. The fact that he wanted to give all his money away to universities and good causes showed that he had that kind of very left-wing idea of sharing wealth rather than accumulating it. You know, Oppenheimer was never an agitator, you know, for a, a left-wing government, but he was certainly pretty keen on it. Oppenheimer's political activities and Oppenheimer's uh, political sympathies actually drew the attention of the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, and actually, he had his uh, phone tapped, he had his mail opened, he was watched, he was followed. Um, you know, obviously, he was in an incredibly sensitive position. And the fact that he had loyalties that may lie elsewhere outside the United States, of course, could have been considered a problem. He soon became the US's greatest chance of building an atomic bomb before the Germans. The most secretive project in US history took place in Los Alamos, New Mexico an isolated desert region where Oppenheimer's team would never be disturbed. There were very, very few people working on the Manhattan Project that knew what was happening. People who were doing the laundry were given these weird devices that they had to, you know, rub over the clothes and to see how many clicks this device meant. Now, those people had no idea what they were doing, but of course, today, we know those are Geiger counters, which are measuring levels of radiation. So, you know, people were aware there was a lot of weird stuff going on uh, in all the locations of the Manhattan Project, especially Los Alamos in New Mexico. Both Groves and Oppenheimer's scientists set out to create nuclear chain reactions using uranium-235 and plutonium-239, two rare isotopes which needed huge levels of funding to procure. I think there was also a sense that America wanted to be top dog in terms of its technology and its research. It wanted to be this, this country that was dominant because obviously at this stage, Germany was seen as a, as a threat. It wasn't Russia or Britain or anywhere else. It was very much a race against time as to who was going to be the first to harness this energy and to come out on top. Three years into the project, the scientists had created two new bombs named Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy had the simpler design. The gun-shaped bomb triggered a nuclear explosion by firing one piece of uranium-235 into another, causing a chain reaction. Fat Man was in turn the more complex of the two. A bulbous, 10-foot bomb containing a sphere of metal plutonium-239, it was surrounded by blocks of explosives that were designed to produce an extremely accurate implosion. 
However, the high risk and high cost of Fat Man made the Los Alamos scientists feel uneasy. And so, Oppenheimer's team insisted on a test run. Minus 20 seconds. Minus 20 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Minus 5 seconds. There was a big worry that actually by triggering a nuclear explosion, you might cause the entire atmosphere to burn up. And if that happened, that would be the end of the world. Now, even though many scientists didn't think that was going to happen, there were a few who were just a little bit worried about it. So in fact, when that first bomb does go off, <laughs> there's a relief in some ways that the world hasn't exploded along with it. Oppenheimer was the American Prometheus because he was this man who had this enormous power and he was frightened of it because when he saw the test, he said, I am become death destroyer of worlds. And I think that's a very powerful thing to say because ultimately it's a responsibility of knowing that you have created this thing, which is not something that you can shy, shy away from or evade. The entire Trinity test was not just for fun, it was leading to what was going to become probably the most single notorious act of the 20th century. The Trinity test succeeded, and onlookers finally realized the enormity of the bomb's power. The Allied powers secured victory in Europe in May 1945. The Nazi Empire finally fell after six long years, and Hitler escaped to his bunker to die by cyanide. However, for the United States, the war was not over yet. Trouble still brewed in the Pacific, and American blood continued to spill. After VE Day was declared in Europe, there was a real problem that America and the rest of the Allied powers were still at war with Japan. And Japan showed absolutely no signs of surrendering. President Roosevelt passed away a month before the Nazi regime's defeat. Harry S. Truman assumed the role of president, only learning of the Manhattan Project's existence 24 hours into the job. The major task of leading the world to peace now landed in Truman's hands. Roosevelt was a very sober man. He understood that what they were dealing with was something of absolute magnitude. And so therefore his idea, and I think he was absolutely right, was that as few people knew about this as possible. And in fact, Truman was at one point, before he was aware of the Manhattan Project, he was seeing all these documents which seemed to be this vast government expense. And he didn't understand why people were spending so much money on this secret project. And he tried to look into it. But he was informed very sternly, no, this is not for you. And so obviously, in the context of war, there are so many things that you're not involved with, you just let it go. But of course, after Roosevelt died, when he became president, he became aware of what was the greatest scientific endeavor that America had ever been involved in. Japan showed no sign of bowing down. Prime Minister Suzuki announced that the Japanese policy towards the declaration was one of mokusatu, killing with silence. From that moment, the dropping of the atomic bomb was inevitable.
At 8.15 a.m. on the 6th of August, 1945, the lead plane Enola Gay released the little boy bomb over Hiroshima. Residents awoke to the most almighty sight in human history. Little boy fell almost six miles in 43 seconds before detonating at an altitude of 2,000 feet. 80,000 people died instantly, some even evaporating on the spot. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. You can imagine that if you are in Hiroshima, you're going about your daily business, there's just this flash of blinding white light, and then all of a sudden everything around you is destroyed. And it is something biblical. I mean, you would have genuinely imagined, if you'd seen it, that this was the end of days. Japan, at this point, was faced with the fact that one of their major in industrial and military bases no longer existed. I mean, a huge number of civilians had been killed. It was an act completely without parallel in modern warfare. It's something, it was literally the first atomic bomb. You would have expected that they would have thought, we can't carry on. But this is Japan we're talking about. This isn't any other country. And so they refused to surrender on the grounds that their attitude was, well, you can keep bombing us. We don't care. We are not going to surrender to you. But of course, the problem is they didn't really understand what they were up against. The bomb obliterated Hiroshima and its people. And yet, the Japanese government still refused to surrender. Three days later, a second bomb landed on Nagasaki. The devastation uh, at Nagasaki is, you know, make no mistake, it's huge. But because Nagasaki is built in sort of valleys and it's got cliffs and things like that, the explosion was much more contained. So relatively less, fewer parts of the city were destroyed compared to Hiroshima. But still you have a death toll, you know, approaching 100,000 people. You know, it is still devastating and it is far greater um, than any other single bomb can possibly produce. Emperor Hirohito broke the government's deadlock, expressing that the Japanese race will be destroyed if the war continues. And so, on the 15th of August, Hirohito announced the end to Japan's suffering over radio broadcast. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Reporters rush out to relive the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. Washington is jubilant. A new wave of cruelty and devastation ended the conflict. Japan officially signed the Surrender Act soon after. Relief spread across the United States. The Second World War was over. Fathers, brothers and sons could come home again. But what exactly did this new power mean for America? What was very interesting about American public reaction to atomic bomb was that it was sold exceptionally well by Truman. But Truman managed to, con to convince them in such a way that if the atomic bomb hadn't been launched, it would a vastly prolonged war with vastly more people dying. So there was actually almost unanimous public support for it. The dropping of the atomic bomb destroyed the traditional competition between offensive and defensive warfare methods. No amount of blockades or shelters could shield citizens from the bomb's fury and rage. The Americans had ultimate control over the most feared weapon on Earth. No one could stand in their way. 
I don't think uh, there's been an event in human history that was quite so consequential because what you showed with that was that man was capable of not just destroying each other on, on a small human scale, but capable of wiping out the world. It was also a sign, as if you'd ever been needed to have it, that we were not anymore in this old-fashioned war of guns and of military invasions and stuff. It was this new, much more terrifying world that was ahead of people. These devices were just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually, the devastation we see at Hiroshima and at Nagasaki it, it is tiny compared to what nuclear weapons would shortly be capable of delivering. Science has profoundly altered the conditions of man's life, both materially and in ways of the spirit as well. It's extended the range of questions which man has a choice. It has extended man's freedom to make significant decisions. It's easy to think that the story of the Manhattan Project ends in August 1945. However, that's far from the case. It's not an exaggeration to say that there was a world before Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed, and a world after Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. The monopoly over atomic weapons placed serious strain on America's relationship with Stalin. A new era of diplomatic tensions burst open at the seams. The use of the atomic bomb in, in the theater of war was something that I think America was perfectly prepared to do. And the fact that it was done in this context in World War II was essentially the way of ending the war and also of showcasing American might. The Cold War continued right up to the late 80s, over 40 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Europe suffered division once again, and a nuclear arms race conquered political discourse. Because of the existence of the atomic bomb, what would have, I think, been a conventional World War III between America and the Soviet Union became a Cold War instead. Neither side wanted to go about creating what was known as mutually assured destruction. And while you have this immense power and you have this immense ability to destroy your enemy, there was also the absolute certainty that whoever's going to blink first is going to be the one who's going to be in trouble. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I am afraid that the answer to that question is yes. In the aftermath of World War II, the US Congress transferred the Manhattan Project's assets to a new agency, the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer took on the role of president of the General Advisory Committee of the AEC. However, from his new role sprang a commitment to nuclear disarmament and control a debate many nuclear scientists found themselves drawn to during the Cold War era. If there is another world war, this civilization may go under. We need to ask ourselves
Oppenheimer was a leading voice in wanting arms control. He knew that uh, nuclear Armageddon, you know, could be imminent if there was going to be a huge nuclear arms race uh, between the world's superpowers. So he actually, ironically, despite being the father in many ways of the atom bomb, spent much of his time subsequently speaking out against it. Certainly he was somebody who, after the war and after the, the launch, was somebody who was, I think he was mistrusted because he didn't seem particularly positive about what he'd done. He seemed to be rather racked with guilt because ultimately it doesn't matter how much of a scientific breakthrough it is, there are consequences. And Oppenheimer knew of him and he was terrified of him. In 1954, these views, coupled with his political convictions, led him to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities during the so-called witch hunt promoted by Senator McCarthy. After the war, you have uh, the establishment of all sorts of committees that are investigating whether people have been loyal to the Soviet Union, acted as Soviet agents. Uh, it was considered that if you really were a member of the Communist Party, you were un-American, you were a de facto traitor. And in fact, Oppenheimer, despite proving his loyalty to the United States by constructing for them the world's first atomic weapon that, that ended the war and arguably saved hundreds of thousands of lives. He was still hauled up by committees and asked to justify himself. So you have this situation in which eventually Oppenheimer's security clearance is revoked because he's considered to be a threat to national security. I think he had a, probably enough humility to know that even if he wasn't involved, it still would have happened. You know, the nuclear physics was there, the money was there, the nuclear bomb would have been built. So I think Oppenheimer knew that ultimately, you know, his place in history was being there at the right place at the right time. Oppenheimer's testimony at the hearing did little to convince the US government. He was deemed unstable and a security risk. Oppenheimer's clearance was revoked a day before it was due to lapse anyway. The revocation humiliated him publicly and barred him from access to codes needed for his work, essentially ending his career as a scientist. With his role as the father of the bomb solidified, Oppenheimer became increasingly worried about the potential danger that scientific inventions could pose to humanity. He published many lectures and gave talks around the world about the role of science and the nature of the universe. Years later, in 1963, his image was rehabilitated by President John F. Kennedy who awarded him the Enrico Fermi Award. This move enraged many politicians, and he remained unpopular amongst the Republicans. In 1965, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. After undergoing unsuccessful treatment, he fell into a coma on the 18th of February, 1966. He died three days later at his home in Princeton, at the age of 62. The legacy of the Manhattan Project is immense. 
The advent of nuclear weapons not only brought an end to the largest war in history, but also ushered in an atomic age and a defining era of big science. Research into nuclear physics, you know, has both been hugely beneficial for mankind. So, you know, the, the understanding how the atom works, of course, has created, uh, you know, forms of scanning technology, which have been brilliant for medicine. Nuclear power, which is arguably the greenest power source on the planet. You, you've got all sorts of uh, developments that have been very beneficial for mankind. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 symbolized a new era for world peace. With the West and East united once again, many thought the years ahead would bring an age of nuclear compromise and calm. And for a time, they did. Nuclear stockpiles peaked in 1986 and steadied off from the 1990s onwards. The appetite to produce more warheads declined. Nevertheless, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 brought fears of nuclear obliteration to the surface once again. The current tension between the West and Russia is merely a new phase in a Cold War that never ended. I think at the moment we're probably closer to a nuclear war than we have been since the Second World War. And it's terrifying, really, that we all go about our daily business. And there is this man not so very far from us with his finger on this trigger. And if he pulls the trigger, our lives as we know them will cease to exist. Russia is, I think, the greatest threat to world peace. Um, and I think the fact that you know, Russia has a nuclear capability is worrying. But it's had a nuclear capability in one way or another since 1949. Uh, and it's never yet used one I I in any conflict. So, you know, we just got to keep our fingers crossed. The birth of the atomic bomb changed the world forever. In the years before the Manhattan Project, a weapon of such power was not even remotely imaginable to most people on Earth. And yet, with war comes new inventions, new ways of destroying the enemy, new machines to wipe out human life. Destruction in Japan has left a mark on every generation since 1945. There isn't a person alive today who does not fear a repeat of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As the only country to have experienced a nuclear attack, Japan stands firm in stating that human beings and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. A profound belief in a world gripped by the nuclear age. I think we've all seen the pictures of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We've all seen exactly what nuclear weapons do. I think that anybody like Putin or anybody else in the world who's ever tempted to think about, oh, this might further my own personal heroism or whatever else, should take a look at those pictures and think very hard about what they're about to do because there are no heroes in this ultimately. You know ultimately that all that it's going to do is lead to untold devastation and untold destruction. What's been very interesting for historians and now filmmakers is to think about what Oppenheimer thought the consequences of his actions were going to be. And certainly he was somebody who, after the war and after the launch, was somebody who was 
I think he was mistrusted because he didn't seem to be positive about what he'd done. He seemed to be rather racked with guilt. I think that he, he warned people of the consequences of what he'd done, just as Einstein was somebody who said, I mean, it's debated to what extent Einstein gave any kind of information to those involved in the Manhattan Project, but he certainly wasn't officially involved in it. And Einstein often said later in life that he wished it had never happened. And you can see both men are faced with a situation where you think, well, this could be the greatest catastrophe the world has ever known, because ultimately it doesn't matter how much of a scientific breakthrough it is, there are consequences. And Oppenheimer knew from and he was terrified of them. When Oppenheimer was cleared by the Biden administration in 2022, that was a very long haul. And, you know, it took decades to get, you know, his reputation restored, if you like. U.S. Secretary Granholm vacated the 1954 revocation of Oppenheimer's security clearance, correcting a historical record and vindicating him in the process. What must it be like to have spent your life doing something and to have done it and to have done it more successfully you can ever imagine, and then to see the consequences of it could potentially be life-changing and not, if not life-destroying for everybody on the planet. So I think that Oppenheimer was racked to a sense of guilt and he was racked to a sense of what have I done? And that's why it's such a fascinating character and why I think you know, he's been a hero of his big budget film this year. In his recent film, director Christopher Nolan delves into the enigmatic persona of Oppenheimer, delving its audience into the mind of a man who struggled with the boundless possibilities of science and the consequences of his actions that brought the world into the age of the atomic bomb. We cannot predict the future. But if one thing is for certain, the threat of nuclear war hangs heavy over the human race, now more than ever. <laughs>